Thank you. I often don't find myself out the front. I think there are more eloquent speakers from, from PHE, but as the focus was on health and well-being, it was one I, I couldn't really avoid, really, to be honest. So the title's a little bit different from what's in the schedule, and the focus for me is probably more on design of health and well-being programmes with reference to um, national um, health and well-being days or months or weeks, as we'll see. So a little bit about Public Health England first before we um, sort of briefly roll into where we've been. So footprints that we've left in the sand or the snow or whatever your preferred um, media would be. And then really just a snapshot of what our health and wellbeing programme looks like. So we could probably spend about half a day on this because it's a research um, area of mine. But I try and compress it into about 15, sort of 12 and a half minutes to equally share it with Jane. So I think I've got about 12 slides, so it should take about 12 minutes. But if anyone wants to talk about any aspect afterwards, you know, grab me. I'll um, provide you with my details if there's any particular aspects that, that interest you. So um, a little bit about what um, Public Health England's mission is. Um, you could probably have a fairly good guess at it. One um, notable strand is to reduce health inequalities. That's obviously a focus within England. And then really the other one is to reduce the burden of um, disease. And I suppose we're more interested in what we call non-communicable disease. So we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about blood pressure. So we'll move on to stakeholders in a second, who we work with. So I think that slide sort of sums up our role quite nicely. If you look at it in terms of a clock face, um, moving from maybe 11 o'clock through to 3 o'clock, that agenda is probably quite familiar with you. And if I mentioned the words Ebola, you, everybody in the room would probably know um, something about Ebola. So we were out there um, in Sierra Leone and other countries in that area um, doing some epidemiology, um, checking sources of outbreaks, obviously treating um, individuals. And now we're in the process of setting up diagnostic laboratories out there. Interestingly, we also support um, the NHS. We're obviously interested in the public health education and development system here in the UK and worldwide. And then finishing at about um, nine o'clock, um, we're also interested in food, water and environment agendas. So these are our stakeholders. Interestingly, we are a stakeholder ourselves. And a little bit more about that as we go forward in terms of our approach to a health and wellbeing programme. But I think that's quite self-explanatory. Our corporate headquarters are in London. Um, and we are around all regions, obviously, in the UK, as the name suggests. So... If you're going to design a health and well-being programme, I think you've got to decide, or one of the first questions I ask myself is, what lenses are we going to use to, to, to view the programme, to view the setup? Lenses is, is really, you, you find this term used in academia a lot. It's basically what you're going to view to view it, whether it's a financial lens, whether it's, an, you know, whether it's going to be a ethical lens, etc., etc. So I've just chosen one management model to share with you today and those of you who are you know done done um, um, courses or qualifications in management will probably be familiar with the pestel model so i'm using that here just to um, highlight the various lenses that we used um, we're going to run through these surprise surprise one by one so political the political lens obviously we're looking at internal and external politics and for us, really, as the name suggests, Public Health England, you know, healthcare is, is, is what we do. So it's, it's pretty obvious what the national politics for us are. But all I'm saying is don't ignore your internal politics as well. I think others made reference to that um, in terms of culture, in terms of experience and health and well-being that you've got within the organisation um, or flowing into the organisation. Stakeholders... Um, I've spoken a little bit about, and the one stakeholder that we probably engage with the most is probably a little bit overlooked when I look at the structures of others' health and wellbeing programmes, are the unions. They're a great source of feedback from employees. So 
if there's one thing, if there's a top tip I would recommend is make sure that you've got good stakeholder engagement with your unions. They certainly threw up some interesting um, data for us in terms of informing the services that we then offered. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, the background to this, the academic background, the commercial cases for this. I think it's well proven what the, what the business case for health and well-being is. And what I'm really just referencing there is if you don't have a business case, you probably should have one particularly if you're going to be going to a financial director or a purse strings holder who's going to, uh, who, who's going to evaluate essentially what you're, what you're bidding for. And really just a note to say, don't forget, don't forget the evaluation in your business case because people are going to want to know if you're spending this money, okay, what's going to be the return on investment? For us, this is probably the, the S, the social, is what we spent most time looking at looking at our demographics, looking at our geography. Obviously, as the name suggests, we're dispersed all across um, England. And we've got probably 60, 60, 65% of our working population is female. They're very highly qualified. We've got lots of professors, lots of PhDs, and probably a master's is probably the lowest level of qualification that you have in our scientific fields. Technology, um, for us, we're particularly interested in the digital agenda. And in fact, we've got a whole digital department that's looking to develop its own clinically effective applications, as well as is looking to develop an accreditation system for third party applications. I think most people in the room will know um, some of the apps out there make some um, rather uh, tenuous claims in relation to health and well-being. So in years to come, I think, uh, and in partnership with the NHS, we will find an accreditation scheme for applications to prove their clinical effectiveness. REACH for us, obviously, it's related to um, the demographics, is we want to um, harness a digital agenda that gives us the reach to be able to reach every individual within the organisation. The other problem we've got specifically is lots of our staff are co-located on NHS Trust websites. So we can find it quite difficult to get messages through to individuals. So we've been very much looking at the telephone in the pocket as a portal for education. Legal. Um, that's all about organisational risk. I'm not going to really talk too much about that because I think that's, that should be pretty clear to most individuals and is really related to the political agenda. And then environmental. Again, this is probably the area that we need to develop somewhat. We've got a couple of programmes, Cycle to Work Scheme. We've got our um, Community Sports Partnership. Um, we partake in the Physical Activity Challenge, if anyone's heard of that. And that tends to qualify physical activity in terms of, um, you know, your carbon footprint. So we need to do some, we, we certainly within Public Health England need to do some further work in the environmental area. But it also includes things like your local environment, the environment that you're working in, and your wider social environment, and if you have any impacts in that area. So that was all about, that was all about, um, which frameworks that you can use and which lenses you can use to look at designing your programme. Another big area for us was looking at, and if you haven't done one, I'd encourage you to do an organisational data audit. And this little side, I think, shows this quite nicely. Um, identify your sources of data that really are within your departments, that within your organisation, and any data that's flowing in to the organisation that's relevant. But equally, data flows out. Um, they can be quite disparate. They can be quite difficult to identify. Um, and for us, one of the interesting things that we did is, rather than just looking at sickness absence data, what we decided to do is we would go and look at every, if I said a mid three, basically a sick or a fit note, we went and we analysed um, what GPs and specialists were writing on those fit notes. And again, that was, that, was, that was quite informative to us. 
and it highlighted the fact that we had a musculoskeletal problem that we needed to develop a strategy for. So that informed a new service which was on-site physiotherapy for us. So that was certainly a rich source of data for us. So I'd encourage you to think about your data and your data sources. Stakeholder engagement. Well, I think there are better people probably in this room that know more about that than I do. But it's really, you know, if I was to sum it up in a slide, it would be the who, the what, the where, when, the why, and the how. Because there are lots of people that you have to influence. And working in a very political um, public sector environment, we have to spend quite a bit of time influencing others, particularly non-specialists. Communication obviously comes into this as well. It might be very familiar to us, but I would uh, encourage you to think about how you tell your stories to others, particularly um, if you're using any technical jargon, because we've certainly fallen foul of that. So plain English is always, is always a useful approach. Um, I think it's good to look to see um, what's out there. Um, benchmarking is an area which is up and coming, and there are some good benchmarks out there. I would always say consult the literature, the academic peer-reviewed literature, and also the grey literature. And if you're not sure what grey literature is, you know, there's some good sources here today. Unfortunately, work for Public Health England, I can't really recommend any sources. But uh, have a good look at the literature. Um, as we're seeing here today, um, dialogue with service providers, exhibitions and conferences are a good opportunity to do that. So we've got engagement with suppliers. And the bottom of this list is probably the area that we struggle with the most currently, is evaluating how effective um, our service offerings and our delivery is. Now, as you might imagine, working for Public Health England, um, we suffer from a lot of intellectual challenge. So if we bring in a new service, you can probably bet your bottom dollar that we've got a specialist within the organisation that will be looking to take that apart before we <coughs> even present it. So that's critical um, engagement for us to engage with the subject specialists and involve them um, in every step of the way. So a little bit about National Awareness Days. <laughs> and it's just to recognise that PHE staff are a, are a subset of the normal population. <laughs> Some people, I'm sure, would smile at that within PHG. So for us, it's national policy which really drives um, which agendas we buy into. Obviously, for us, I've spoken about non-communicable disease. But here we're talking about, you'll probably be familiar with lots of these um, cross-cutting public agendas. You've seen on your televisions, obviously, Change for Life. One U has just been launched for working adults and obviously the programme for Start for Life. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to go, go have a look. Um, another area for us is, is very much impact and obviously the data behind that. Smoking obviously again um, is still responsible for significant mortality in this country. So we clearly buy into Stoptober, um, National Non-Smoking Day, Again, skin cancer is on our agenda this year. Again, another significant source of um, preventable illness. And again, physical activity. So these are all sort of normal components, I would imagine, of most um, health and wellbeing programmes in this room. And of course, they're not just days, they're weeks. And in some cases, there, there are even months. Um, we're part of, obviously, a cross-civil service health and well-being group, and, of course, with public health and health being in the title, it's the other groups that are normally looking to us for some sort of steer. So, again, what we do in Public Health England tends to influence, to a, to a greater or lesser degree, what other government departments do. And, finally, on National Awareness Days, and there's more maybe of an HR theme here, and I've had a look at the delegates list, and I know there are quite a few HR folk in the room. Um, but certainly you can focus your, your national agenda around your um, E&D strategy. And they're just a couple um, that are up there that we support and promote ourselves internally. So what does health and well-being at PHE look, look like, um, in essence? 
highly educated workforce, geographically spread, and we're undergoing significant change. Some of you will be familiar with Port and Down, um, certainly where I'm based in Collindale in North London and our corporate headquarters. We're, we're all co-locating to Harlow. That programme has started now. That's going to end in, I think, about 2023. So there's significant change going on, regardless of the government's cost-saving agenda in the background. So we're lucky enough to have a very high-profile um, chief executive. So our strategy is led from board level. We have a strategy in place. Isn't necessarily congruent with what we're doing operationally and it always you know, make sure you're checking in with the strategy to, to make sure operationally you're delivering what you should be doing because, again, we've been caught out with that in the past. We've got, some human, we've got a budget and we've got some human resources. We spend probably somewhere in the region of about 200k on services. Um, probably about half of that is staff costs. We've got two health and wellbeing coordinators. But obviously being geographically spared, we've got a number of sort of volunteer champions through a network across, the, across England that really deliver um, locally for us. We've got a business and an operational plan and we're still refining our engagement and communication strategies and again that's part of the wider business um, cycle. And for us now the focus going forward has got to be on evaluation and, and impact. So that's me at this stage. As I said, I'd like to share more about the structure of our, um, of our health and wellbeing programme, but if anyone wants to chat about that, can do that, can do that afterwards. So I'm going to hand over to Jane at this stage and not take any questions because I'm aware that time is running away from us. So thank you. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jane Hubbard, Head of HR at Chester Zoo. Um, Bill actually did say, what's the connection between us two? And then I did make the comment that I'd uh, gone to a, a national event last week, and there is actually now proven scientific data that viewing aquaria, viewing zoos, actually does improve mental health. Um, somebody did a PhD on it down in the National Aquarium. Uh, so quite interesting connection. Um, People always see me out in the public eye and they see the Chester Zoo uniform, the blue polo shirt, and of course what they always say is, oh, what do you do at the zoo? And I actually tell them that I am the best curator of Chester Zoo. And of course, I look after people. Um, without further ado, what I'm going to do is show you literally a minute and a half video clip um, with a bit of technical help from my friend at the back to try and put Chester Zoo um, in terms of its scope and its size so you get more of an idea of who we are and what we're about. every time so do forgive me. Um, I'm going to spend, spend about 10 minutes just talking about uh, first of all some of the freebies that are on offer uh, of which there are lots then I'm going to put it into a, a sort of context about what we actually pay for and then I'm going to give you a success story for one of those freebies and hopefully you'll realize that there's so much out there that you can use and use at no cost. So a couple of things up there. We've got NHS in, in the top left. I'm not going to talk about them in, in depth because that's part and parcel of the case study because we actually um, cotton onto something called Heart Start. So I'll leave that right to the end. 
Um, we're very lucky where we're positioned because we have lots of councils, lots of colleges, lots of universities. Everybody wants to work with Chester Zoo and I would say never use the opportunity to partner with people and get contra deals going and I'll, I'll talk more commercially about that a bit later on. So things like Carers and Employment was a national funded project which was designed to keep people who care for others in employment. It sounds so easy to say, come along, let's signpost you to financial benefits, let's signpost you to support groups, let's introduce you to new technology. One of them is a, a Facebook type diary. Instead of people actually phoning up friends and family for support, they put this on a Facebook and it said, look, can anybody pick mum's shopping up? Can somebody just go and chat to dad for five minutes? And that actual social diary actually works far better because people don't feel as if they're being put on the spot when you phone them up. And that actually went down out of all the offerings on that day. That went down really well. Babcock, um, I'm sure you, most of you have got MVQ providers, but Babcock is still free funding, uh, and actually all the sort of provision that they, they make for, it actually includes things like not just your team leading, not just your, your customer service, but it does give you ad hoc functional skills as well, which can enhance people in the well, well-being sort of market in terms of their mental health. We work in partnership with a, a charity, another charity called Autism Together, Again, they had some government funding to come in and, and raise autism awareness in the organisation. And it was a double whammy at first because obviously we have um, people in the environment that have family and friends who are autistic, but also our guests. So they came along and they were absolutely amazed by the work we already do with uh, those groups that need specific help. And they turned around and said, actually, could, can we sort of partner with you? So we've ended up working with them now for 18 months and we've just had our first autism champion training. That means that uh, 45 people have actually gone through training specifically to look at how to approach people who may be autistic, how to assist uh, families who might be suffering from other people looking at them because obviously they've, they've got somebody with them that, that might not be following the normal path in terms of looking at the animals, that they're quite disturbed, they might need quiet space. And actually, we're aiming towards the end of this year to run an autistic uh, friendly day. As you can imagine, the excitement coming to that sort of environment, we've had to build in special quiet places, we've had to build in special people who can actually deal with sometimes meltdowns, and that's proving great, very successful, and it was completely free. We've had people in like Dementia Friends, again, free funding, you know, always keep on the lookout, get networking. We're terrible as HR people, we think, oh, boring network meeting, I'm not going. Go to it because you pick up one, that little thread of information that will lead you to something that is free. West Cheshire College is one of my local colleges, just an example. We know the training levy is going to hit us next year, but West Cheshire are throwing courses at me. And it's not just in functional skills, sort of English and maths and ICT, O-level and A-level type level. They're actually throwing in things like dementia care, diabetes care. They're actually throwing in things like how to administer medication. And actually all of those things are not just viable in my workplace, they're viable in people's social living space. So they're all free. Against a sort of background of what some of the things that we do at Chester Zoo, which aren't free. So we've got a choir. It costs me £25 an hour, and it costs me an hour a month, an hour each week per month. So that's £100 a month for a choir. That's all it costs. They come out whistling and singing and humming and smiling and do be doing all over the place. And it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, and it doesn't cost much. You can see that there are probably some brand names up there, like Sodexo, Perks, the Cycle Care Scheme. They're all bog standard. I'm not going to talk about them. What I am going to pick up are, are things like things like Working Welsh. This, again, was a free initiative. You can actually apply, because we're on the borderline of, um, obviously, northwestern Wales, you can apply for little badges. So those Welsh-speaking uh, members of the workforce can actually proudly display, I speak Welsh. Please, if you need any help, speak to me. Actually, we've got a lot of English people who live in Wales and actually couldn't speak Welsh. So we put a Welsh language course on. Again, it cost us £25 a month for eight weeks. And I got 30 people through who are now wearing that Welsh badge because they've now got OCR level one. So it worked a treat. I also put up there things like uh, one of our financial advisors. Now, this is probably the most expensive thing that we've invested in recently. It cost us £800 a month. But I've got 400 permanent employees. I've got 450 seasonal employees. And they're on a three to, to six to nine month contract. And actually, any employee can access it for a 15 minute freebie. 
They also run workshops for us twice a year. They also come in and actually give specific pension information. And we do that at our all staff briefing. We do that twice a year. That's all inclusive. And you know, I mentioned the little contra deals. Don't forget that everybody wants to visit Chester Zoo. I'm sure that whatever you guys, whatever subject uh, specialism you're into, you'll be able to do a contra deal with somebody. There's an X8 right in the top right hand corner. This is a commercial contract to get people from the railway station to the zoo on a park and ride type scheme. And we sort of piggybacked in and said, do you think you could extend it to the staff if we give you some staff tickets? And they did. But what I want to do is take this slide, it looks a bit complicated, to take you through what happened on our journey with something that was completely free. Some communities um, were probably approached by groups to take on defibrillators. This, again, I think was part of a government scheme to make sure that communities that perhaps were on the borderline of hospitals, borderlines of ambulance services, they actually had access to a defibrillator. So along came Northwest Ambulance Service and plonked two defibrillators for us and said, we'll train you in them. We thought, great, actually, they're so good, we'll better get a few more. So we've got five on site. And to put it in context, you saw it's 125 acres. You now know we've got over 800 employees. We actually got a lot of land to, to sort of um, cover, if you like. And I just put it in context, we get 1.7 million visitors a year. So that's quite a lot. So going back to the defibs, it was a chance conversation with the ambulance man that came in to do the training, because me being me, I'm always nosy and poking my nose in where I shouldn't be. And what's going on in here? We're doing some defib training. Actually, you know, you, your, your staff are really interested in this, and, and I can see there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a win-win here. Have you heard about Heartstart? What's that? Went on the NHS website, and there's a whole raft of initiatives that you can actually take up, which are completely free. Heartstart is simply two hours of someone's time to understand how to do cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. It's as simple as that. Heartstart will also train your people to be instructors so you can train the trainer to train others. And that's what we did. We took the materials, we got our people trained up in it, we then started to train our own people, and I've now got 29% of my permanent workforce trained up. And that's in less than 12 months. Now, sad though it may be, we get lots of visitors. It was literally two days after the course was run. Um, our security team had a shout. Um, we went to the area that the, the shout was in to find a young girl had collapsed. She was 12 years of age, her heart had stopped beating, and it stopped beating for technically 45 minutes. If those people who hadn't done heart start weren't there, weren't there in terms of the first chain of survival, she wouldn't be here today. Two weeks later, she put a pacemaker on, she came back to the zoo, and she visited her visit. So that was great. From an enrichment point of view from people, um, it's not just about helping people in the zoo because we've had two incidences where people have helped people collapse at bus stops and one in a market hall. So again, it's, it's a societal sort of help as well. And in terms of enriching totality, everyone in the organization, we have picked up so many awards, which we're so proud of. In 2015, we picked up the UK Heart Start Organization of the Year Award. We picked up three individual Lifesaver Awards and we picked up a gold NHS Cardiac Award. And we're expecting more this year as well. We've got the Countess of Chester Hospital, that's the chain of survival, so that's first point of contact, first on the scene, and also St John's Everyday Heroes Organisation of the Year. And that all came from one conversation and one reference back to the NHS website. And to give you an idea of what else we're running, we're going to run in the next 12 months, Hydration Week, Movember, um, Alcohol Awareness, Stoptober, you name it, we must have about 15 campaigns, and they are all absolutely free. Thanks for listening. Some of the other rooms have broken and we are planning to start in about 10 minutes in the next. This is just a short comfort break. But did anyone have any questions? I think there were two on Slido, if you want to have a quick look at those. Does PHE have on their radar UK Active National Fitness Day? Um, I don't think that's on our agenda at the moment, but physical activity certainly is and we obviously have to um, limit, I think, what we, what we can promote. I'm personally not aware of that one, but something I'll look into. Yeah. Second question, what can you tell us about the Workplace Wellbeing Charter from PHE? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I was hoping that might come up, actually. The Workplace Wellbeing Charter, um, 
I think it's still actually owned by, the, or the rights for it, it's still actually owned, if that's the right word, by Liverpool County Council. Now, we're going down that charter route ourselves. The issue is it's a regional charter, and organisations such as PHE, we're obviously looking to nationally accredit. But I believe we're developing our own version of that charter and or looking to, you know, possibly looking to harmonise the other, the other competing charters that are out there. So if anybody, again, wants to talk about the charter and maybe doing an audit of your organisation, then happy to give you some advice regarding that.